The objectives of this module are to introduce how hazard analysis fits within the engineering process, explain the difference between hazard analysis and failure modes and effects analysis, and demonstrate the process of completing a hazard analysis for a sample project. When we talk about product safety, many people's first thought regards standards, and it's true that complying with accepted standards is an important step in ensuring your design's safe. From a liability perspective, industry-recognized standards capture best-known engineering practices, so you should do some digging. Engineers who fail to adhere to well-known best practices for safety can be held liable for injuries in court. But from a broader perspective, as an engineer, you have an ethical obligation to hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. So how do we do that? If we step back and look at a very high-level overview of the engineering design process, there are several key phases, like identifying stakeholder needs, turning those into requirements, developing concepts, and then developing detailed engineering designs and implementing them. Standards help us loop in best practices and broader community needs early in the process. It allows us to pull these things into our requirements document, but it doesn't necessarily help us consider safety throughout the other phases of the design process. What we need are tools to help us check ourselves and others. I once heard a great talk by Rand and CH2M Hill about the fact that we must break the idea that things are going to be a particular way in a particular perfect future. Instead, we need tools that help us imagine and explore the multiple possible futures of the projects that we're working on. This is what we need to help us make sure our products are safe, a way to imagine possible futures, possible uses, and possible misuses of our designs. Luckily, there are many tools to help us here. Hazard analysis and failure modes and effects analysis help the design team internally check our designs and look for holes in our logic. They help us imagine those myriad alternative uses for our products. Third-party reviews, sometimes linked to testing by certified labs, help question assumptions that a design team may be working under that could impact safety. They also bring new perspectives to the design, perhaps pulling in a broader range of stakeholders. And finally, testing forces us to verify and validate our assumptions and prove that we are meeting needs and requirements in the real world. Together, these things help us design safe, robust products. Hazard analysis and failure modes and effects analysis are similar, complementary tools. Hazard analysis is typically done early in a project before the detailed design is complete to capture safety concerns that might otherwise be missed. It's a top-down analysis looking at the big picture, the system level. In contrast, failure modes and effects analysis is best completed after design has been developed a little more. It refines the hazard analysis by looking at safety from a bottom-up perspective of components or subsystems that could fail. Both are valuable, but we're going to focus on hazard analysis. The purpose of hazard analysis is to capture known and reasonably foreseeable hazards to humans due to installation, use, and decommissioning of a product. The idea is to document what-if scenarios for the system and discuss what will be done by the design team to address them. It's the first step in the iterative product risk management process. It's important to note that while this module will focus on hazards to human safety, a similar approach could be taken to assess environmental or even technical systems hazards. Now that we've decided to complete a hazard analysis, we need to do a couple of things before beginning in earnest. We need to make sure everyone is on the same page with the system boundary and scope, and we need to capture the system description and the intended use case. Let's pretend our project is to design a small, portable dialysis machine for use by individuals with renal failure. For those not familiar with dialysis, it's a process of removing waste and excess water from the blood, and is used primarily as an artificial replacement for lost kidney function. Okay, so we're designing a portable dialysis machine. It has to be safe, but to really think through the hazards, we need some concept of the system we are designing and how it will be used. As a team, we develop the diagram shown that captures the major process components for a dialysis, and then clearly marked out what is part of our system. We also know from our client that the primary use scenario would involve use in a small urban clinic with oversight by a nurse. Finally, we know that the concept we are pursuing would involve single-use disposable tube sets and filters for the machine. So, we'll have a machine with the process shown in the diagram. It will be plugged into both the grid for power and our patient's blood system, and it will use disposable filters and tubes. Sort of a Keurig for dialysis. Now that we've clarified our concept a bit, we can start to identify hazards that might be associated with that concept. Hazards in this usage are considered high-level areas of concern. So rather than identifying part X might get hot, We'll start out by just noting that there may be heat hazards in this device during this step. You can brainstorm possible hazards, use a list of common hazards like the one shown, or some combination of the two. Look at the list shown and write down some hazards you might foresee in the dialysis machine. Great! While your list might have differed, here are some of the hazards that jumped out to me for this product. Now we're going to drill down and use our imagination, and that concept diagram we created, to identify one or more potential causes for each of the identified hazards. 
You're being asked here to imagine all the ways your design could be used or misused to create each hazard to human health. So, for example, if the hazard is contamination due to waste products or device disposal, one potential cause could be that blood remains in the system after the disposable cartridge is replaced, which would contaminate the next patient. If the hazard is inadequate warning of hazards like the use of single-use devices, the cause for that might be the patient uses a single-use disposable cartridge more than once. These are reasonably foreseeable causes for the identified hazard. Now it's your turn. What might be a potential cause for a pressure hazard in the context of our dialysis machine? Okay, so we've identified broad hazards, identified one or more potential causes for each of those hazards. Now let's talk about severity. The question now is, if this hazard is recognized, if the potential cause happens, how severe will the impact be on the human? Will this event cause catastrophic problems leading to multiple fatalities, or will this event not actually cause any injuries? Obviously, the more severe the consequences of this hazard, the more we're concerned by it. To assist in your categorization of hazards, you can reference standard definitions. Many companies have internal definitions they use as a baseline. For our purposes, let's use the Wikipedia definitions shown. Take a minute and read them. Now let's take a look back at the identified hazard and figure out its severity. If blood remains in the system after the disposable cartridge replacement is complete, contaminating the next patient, what is the severity? You may have come to a different conclusion, that an argument could be made for serious or even fatal injury in this event. While it depends on the level and type of cross-contamination, hazardous seems like a reasonable choice for severity. With the severity identified, we need to think about the probability of occurrence. If we agree that more severe hazards need more attention than less severe hazards, then we also need to take into account how likely those severe cases will occur. If something would definitely kill someone but is extremely improbable, is that more or less important to the design team than something that will definitely kill someone that is probable? We should probably deal with the probable situation first, and that's why we include probability in our consideration here. Let's go back to blood contamination here. How probable is it that this will occur? This one is hard to determine without more information on the design concept being explored. But let's say that no purge or safety system had been considered to date by the design team. Then it is probable, right? Hopefully hazard analysis will help you find some items you haven't yet considered in your design. While we've been focused on this one hazard, in reality your project will have many rows of hazards that you will be identifying and assigning severity and probability numbers to. To help us sort out and think about which hazards are most critical, we'll assign each hazard a criticality number. The criticality is simply the severity times the probability. The idea here is that if we rank our hazards by criticality, the most severe, highly probable hazards will jump to the top of the list. Said another way, the higher the criticality number, the more critical it is to address the hazard. And we do need to address critical hazards. It isn't enough to just make a list of hazards and then call it quits. So, your team will need to sit down and look at the list of identified hazards and decide how to mitigate them. Typical mitigations include updates to the design of the device, changing the manufacturing or assembly process controls or adding new controls, warning the operator about the hazard with a label, or requiring a specific maintenance regime for the device. For our example of cross-contamination, after some discussion within the team, we decided it probably makes sense to mitigate the hazard by actual design updates to the device that ensure no cross-contamination. But it also will probably require some labeling to remind nurses about the importance of avoiding cross-contamination. And with that, we've completely finished one row of a hazard analysis. Now, your actual hazard analysis will have many rows and the question comes up, do I need to mitigate every identified hazard? The answer is no. Sometimes a response isn't needed. Typically, companies or teams will set a criticality number above which a response is required. The table shown is similar to those used by many companies for setting acceptable product risk. Typical companies will stipulate that extreme or high risk items must be either addressed or receive explicit approval from management if they are not addressed. Items below that are often left to engineering discretion. Again, this varies widely from company to company and industry to industry. For your design project, consider using this suggestion. Mitigate the extreme and high-risk items. Debate and note the reasoning for or against your choice to mitigate medium-risk items. And don't worry about mitigating most low-risk items. And those are the basics of hazard analysis. So if your project has safety considerations, here are some practical steps you can take. First, research standards and codes that may apply to your project. Integrate those into your requirements. Complete a hazard analysis. Don't make this onerous. 
Schedule a one-hour meeting with the team, brainstorm and capture the analysis in a spreadsheet during the meeting, and then translate the mitigations into individual action items or requirements. Discuss acceptable risk openly with your team and client. It's important that as you make these decisions, you are getting feedback on your acceptable risk definition. And finally, if you have questions, ask. The faculty advisors and course faculty are ready to help you address safety at any point in your project. Now let's check your understanding of hazard analysis.